Hey friends, welcome back to Grand Adventure. I'm your host, Mark Guido, and welcome to the bucolic hamlet of Bridger in the southeastern corner of Montana. While we're here, we're gonna check off a bucket list item of mine, and that is visiting Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument, the home of Custer's Last Stand. And while we're here, we're also gonna learn a bit more about the crow culture, so stay tuned. This episode of Grand Adventure is sponsored by The Dirt Pro. Find the campsite that's right for you from over 44,000 listings, either on the web or on their number one ranked mobile app. Try all of the Pro features free for 90 days by using the promo code GRANDADVENTURE90. So here in Bridger, we did end up on full hookups again, but we've ended up in a very special situation that I would like to explain to you. You may remember from our last episode in Leadville, Colorado, that we got swarmed on Friday night when all the weekenders showed up and took over the boondocking meadow that we were occupying just outside of Leadville. So come Saturday morning, we took off and we ran and we just kept running. Uh, we made it as far Saturday night as Casper, Wyoming. We got a campground there and continued back on the road on Sunday. And we got just across the line in Wyoming into Montana when we found this spot in Bridger. Now, you may have heard about the tremendous heat wave that's affecting the entire western part of the United States. So we knew that we were either going to have to go to high elevation or find hookups for air conditioning, one or the other. And we ended up with the latter when we got here to Bridger. Now, the nice thing about this situation in Bridger is this is a beautiful little town. Uh, it's a small ranching community right where the Great Plains meet the, the Beartooth Mountains, literally right at the junction between the two. So we've got plains in one direction and mountains in the other. And the town has a population of just under 300 people but they have a town park where they've put pedestals for six RV campsites with full hookups. It is 30 amp, not 50 amp, so we're only able to run one of our air conditioning units, but it's for 20 bucks a night. And where are you gonna find full hookups for $20 a night? We're able to walk to literally everything in town, everything we need. There's a small supermarket, two blocks that way, two blocks this way. I found a garage where I got my oil changed. Uh, this has been an absolutely terrific spot for us, and we've really fallen in love with this town. I'd love to show you around a little bit. I misspoke just a moment ago. I just looked it up, and Bridger's population is actually right around 700, not 300. Settled in 1898, it's a tiny ranching community in southeastern Montana's Clarks Fork Valley of the Clarks Fork Yellowstone River. Residents originally wanted to name the town after Georgetown, one of the original settlers. But Town encouraged residents to name the newly founded town after his old friend Jim Bridger, the trapper, explorer, and mountain man who guided many early expeditions across the West. We've found everything we need here, in addition to the terrific grocery with amazing beef and the garage where I got my oil changed. We've got fuel and propane, a pizza shop, and a half dozen taverns all within walking distance of a few blocks of our campsite. At each, we found the citizenry open, pleasant, and inviting. If we need more, absolutely anything is available in Billings, an easy 45 miles away. We truly couldn't ask for more.
We'll be back in just a moment to explore the sites and history surrounding both the Battle of Little Bighorn and the Native Crow people. But first, we'd like to share something that we absolutely love about our sponsor, the Dirt Pro. Many spots around this part of southeastern Montana lack cell service, but Pro members can search the Dirt's campground listings offline to find the perfect spot to spend a night or even a week, even without internet. Through a special arrangement, our grand adventurers can try all of the Pro features of the Dirt free for 90 days, just by using the promo code GRANDADVENTURE90. So what do you have to lose? Use the link below in the video description to try the Dirt Pro for free today. We're taking the opportunity to check Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument off my bucket list while we're camped nearby in Bridger on the 145th anniversary of the battle. Most battles between the Army and the Lakota, including the Battle of Little Bighorn, took place on lands the Lakota had taken from other tribes since the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie. The steady Lakota invasion into treaty areas belonging to smaller tribes ensured the United States firm Indian allies in the Crow people during the Sioux Wars, which took place from 1854 to 1890, due to increasing conflict between the natives of the Great Plains and encroaching white settlers. Already in 1873, Crow Chief Blackfoot had called for U.S. military actions against Lakota, Sioux, and Cheyenne intruders. There were numerous skirmishes between the Sioux and Crow tribes. So when the Sioux were in the Little Bighorn Valley in 1876, without the consent of the Crow tribe, the Crow supported the U.S. Army to expel them. Six Crow warriors worked as scouts for General Custer at the time of the battle. In early June 1876, General George Armstrong Custer's 12 companies departed westward from Fort Lincoln in the Dakota Territory while General George Crook's column of 20 companies and Brigadier General Alfred Terry's column of 12 companies all moved north from Fort Fetterman in the Wyoming Territory. At the same time, another six companies under the command of Colonel John Gibbons headed eastward from Fort Ellis in western Montana. All were to convene on the Lakota Sioux and Cheyenne encampment along the Little Bighorn River in a three-pronged assault. At sunrise on June 25, Custer scouts reported they could see a massive pony herd and signs of the Native American village, about 15 miles distant. When Custer realized that their presence had been discovered and mistakenly believed that the group of natives seen on his trail had alerted the village, he abandoned plans to launch a surprise attack the next morning, after spending a day scouting the village. Instead, he decided to begin his assault without delay. Custer's scouts warned him about the size of the village, with Crow native Mitch Boyer reportedly cautioning that this was the largest village he had ever heard of. But Custer's overriding concern was that the Native American group would break up and scatter. Custer believed that the hostiles numbered approximately 800, when in fact, his scouts believed the true number to be between 1,500 and 2,500 warriors. When the scouts began changing back into their native dress right before the battle, Custer released them from his command. On the morning of June 25th, Custer divided his 12 companies into three battalions in anticipation of the forthcoming engagement. Three companies were placed under the command of Major Marcus Reno, and three were placed under the command of Captain Frederick Benteen. Five companies remained under Custer's immediate command. Reno launched the first assault upon the encampment, but quickly realized that the native village was far larger than anticipated. His men were quickly flanked by the native warriors and they retreated to these bluffs, known today as Reno Hill, to be joined about a half hour later by Captain Benteen's column arriving from the south. Having isolated Reno's force and driven them away from their encampment, the bulk of the native warriors were free to pursue Custer. Custer believed that Benteen would arrive to support his men and fired rifle volleys to summon help. However, Benteen concentrated on reinforcing Reno's detachment rather than continuing on towards Custer's position. The precise details of Custer's fight here on Last Stand Hill are largely conjectural, since none of the roughly 210 men under his immediate command survived the battle. In the end, this hilltop was probably too small to accommodate all of the survivors and wounded. Fire from the southeast made it impossible for Custer's men to secure a defensive position all around Last Stand Hill. By almost all accounts, the Lakota annihilated Custer's force within an hour of engagement. 
These white markers throughout the battlefield mark where U.S. cavalry soldiers' bodies were found, while the red markers note the locations where fallen native warriors were found. Custer's body was found with two gunshot wounds, one to his left chest and the other to his left temple. We're taking the back roads across the prairie to return to our camp at Bridger, passing through the Crow Reservation to learn more about their people and their culture. But along the way, we wanted to stop to check out Bighorn Canyon for a future kayaking stop. This is where the Yellowtail Dam holds back the Bighorn River, filling a canyon with walls painted by nature in hues of red and green. This is a national recreation area maintained by the National Park Service, where the Crow tribe is a concessionaire. It's beautiful, ensuring that we'll one day return for a paddle. Our objective for taking the back route, though, is Chief Plenty Coos State Park in the tiny reservation hamlet of Pryor. Crow Chief Plenty Coos, the English translation of his native name meaning many achievements, was wise well before his time. At age 11, Chief Plenty Coos dreamt of the little people that Crow folklore told lived in the Pryor Mountains. In Plenty Coos' vision, the little people introduced him to a buffalo that turned into a man with buffalo-like features, who led him underground and down a tunnel toward the Pryor Mountains. The buffalo man showed Plenty Coos a vision of endless streams of bison coming out of a hole in the ground, but disappearing, followed by a second stream of bison with different tails, sounds, and colors, some even with spots, that came up out of the ground and remained on the plains. Finally, he had a vision of himself as an old man, surrounded by a vast forest whose trees had been felled by a great wind. Only a chickadee remained. Tribal elders told Plenty Coos that his vision meant that the buffalo would soon disappear, to be replaced by white men's cattle. But the Crow people would survive the coming tide of white people if they developed their listening skills and minds like the chickadee, and they would inherit their land. Guided by this vision, the Crow Nation did survive. And today, the Crow Indian Reservation is only a short distance from the Pryor Mountains. Unlike many other Native American tribes that were relocated to reservations on entirely different land, Plenty Coups lobbying in the U.S. Congress kept his tribe on their own ancestral land.
Plenty Coos was named Chief of the Crow at age 28 in 1876, the same year as the Battle of Little Bighorn. When he passed away in 1932 at age 84, he was considered by his people to be the last of the great chiefs. The vision he had had when he was younger had come true. Education is your most powerful weapon, he said to his people. With education, you are the white man's equal. Without education, you are his victim and so shall remain all your lives. When Plenty Coos gave up his nomadic ways in 1884, he became one of the first Crow to own and settle on a farm, which was deeded to him through the Federal Indian Allotment Act. The Crow people look upon Chief Plenty Coos in much the same way that white Americans view George Washington. Inspired by a visit to Washington's Mount Vernon plantation in Virginia in 1928, Chief Plenty Coos donated 195 acres of his personal land to Bighorn County to create a park for future generations to enjoy. This park is not to be a memorial to me, he said, but to the Crow Nation. It is given as a token of my friendship for all people, both red and white. We'll finish this episode with a drive across Pryor Gap, through the remote Pryor Mountains, just east of our campground in Bridger, and sacred to the Crow people and Chief Plenty Coos. So we truly hope that you've enjoyed visiting this corner of southeastern Montana and learning with us. Uh, now coming up next week, we've got a decision to make. We have the July 4th holiday weekend coming up and this heat wave is showing no signs of abating. So we may just stay put and examine some other things to see in the other direction while we're here. Maybe head into Billings. Maybe head over Beartooth Pass up through Red Lodge. We have all kinds of things that we can see and explore while we're here. So we may still stick around here for one more week to share with you Grand Adventurers. So if you're not yet a Grand Adventurer, this is the perfect time to go smash that little red subscribe button. The one right down there in the lower right hand corner of your screen. And ring that notification bell to be sure that you come along on each and every Grand Adventure each and every Wednesday evening. And we'd be honored if you shared the channel with your friends, family, and on social media. Now, it's extremely important to us that if you like this video, please be sure to give us a big thumbs up down below. And while you're down below, 
That's where you'll find the comment section where we'd love to hear from you after each episode. So until next week, please remember, life is nothing but a grand adventure, and we'll see you then.